I'm Marlene Graff. I'm a member of the ETE committee, and I get to introduce Mike today. So Mike Christiansen was born and raised here in northern Utah. He graduated from high, Skyview High School in 1997. He later attended Utah State, received his uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry in 2004. After that, he went on to study at BYU, earning his organic chemistry PhD in 2010. After that, he did his postdoc um, cancer research at CSU and was later hired to teach at USU's regional campus in Vernal, which is where he lives now with his wife and four children. He has an infectious passion for teaching, strives to infuse his students with chemistry enthusiasm. Yes. Mike often says, teaching isn't just what I do, it's who I am. And so we're excited to turn the time over to him. And here you go. Okay. Thank you folks for attending my talk. It's good to have you here. So I gave the same talk at, sorry, I'll put this microphone on. Now Ryan, is this a good location for the microphone? Is that okay? Okay. All right, so I gave the same talk a couple of weeks ago at a conference, a chemistry education conference. Boyd, welcome. Hello, it's Mike. good to see you here. Oh, anyway. Boyd was our former uh, dean and sort of leader down at the Vernal campus, and he's now teaching physics as, uh, here in Logan. We miss you. How sad do I look about teaching physics? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm broken up over. Anyway, so I gave the same uh, talk a couple of weeks ago at a chemistry teaching conference in Colorado. And the talk is actually, tw my talk there was 20 minutes. I didn't finish all of it. Here I have 35 minutes. I'm anticipating that I might get done early. Hopefully you guys are okay with that. Anyway, but the point is, in order to fill up the time so that I actually take the full 35 minutes or not, whatever the case may be, I'm inviting you guys, and I'm dead serious about this, please ask questions if you've got them while I'm talking. You can interrupt. You don't even have to raise your hand. I don't, I'm, I'm cool with that. I won't be offended. If you guys have questions about anything I'm saying, Interrupt, ask, I'm happy with it. I love answering questions. With that said, I have a remote control that looks like it's from a, a Magnavox television from the 1980s. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Is, is this, how do I advance on this, Ryan? Do I, uh, just, okay. Do I, I'll just go here to the laptop manually and we will try this and see if that works, okay. Okay, so I've got a couple of theory slides that I'm gonna talk about. There exists a, a theory in education called constructivist theory, and we talk about this all the time. Can, I don't want to get in anyone's way. I will sit down and narrate boringly as much as I can. <laughs> so constructivist theory learning happens when students internalize and build conceptual understanding from prior knowledge. So theoretically this occurs best when students sort of uh, make their own discovery at self-paced and it's self-driven. So as an extension or sub-theory of constructivist theory, there exists this other theory called informational processing theory that includes the idea that because students' attention spans are limited, their learning has, or their ability to learn and retain new information uh, has to be inherently selective. And by the way, all the references that I'm citing here, I've got a slide at the very end where I show all the references. If any of you guys are interested, you want to jot down the number that I've got here, I'll show you the references slide at the end. So, um, so as a result, according to this theory, learning uh, is amplified when students can learn selectively in small chunks and at their own pace. Now, you guys understand in, in the typical teaching setting that we do as uh, university instructors, that is not always possible to have students all be able to learn completely at their own pace and learn selectively the chunks that they need to. Uh, so it's sort of this challenge of being able to do that. So when compared with traditional lecture, and you guys know what I'm talking about when I say the traditional lecture format of me standing in front of you and, and lecturing at you as students and you guys listen and take notes, um, the flipped learning classroom approach technically or theoretically comes closer to this ideal of self-paced learning. Now, if any of you guys, how many of you guys have, have, once again, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but, sorry, how many of you guys by raise of hands have not heard of flipped learning? Is that new to anyone? Okay. Okay, cool. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But anyway, so, um, <laughs> with, the way flipped learning works is we push our lectures outside of class on videos, essentially. And students' assignment is to go outside of class and watch videos where all the content delivery happens. And typically in my videos, I uh, present the same information that I would present in a lecture. And then in class, they do what you would usually view as being homework, or they can do other higher learning activities. And that's the way flip learning typically works. So you can sort of see why it's called flipped. It's because what we usually do in class and what students do at home have been flipped. Hopefully that makes sense. So. Um, Anyway, one study that was interesting on this suggests that uh, 
that the simple level of engagement, as simple as it is of being able to jump back and forth. Oh dear, I think I just lost my microphone. Hang on, I'll wrap it around my neck. It's really long. I don't mean to complain, Ryan. The, the cord is very long. Anyway, so <laughs> one of the things you can do with uh, flip learning videos, obviously, is you can control the pace at which you learn to some extent, and you can re-watch uh, videos or sections that you don't understand as well. And you can speed up videos or even skip videos that deal with concepts you already know. And so that, even that small amount of engagement of, of adding that uh, factor of being able to self-pace your learning, one study shows that even that small, simple la level of engagement that, in, that is inherent in flipped learning, because you're dealing with videos instead of an instructor that you can't control the pace of, uh, actually increases cognitive retention and student satisfaction when they did some survey data. So um, my journey or adventure in flipping uh, started back in 2011, 2012. So at the end of 2011, one of my colleagues, Leanna Etchberger, emailed me a link to an article from USA Today talking about flipped learning. I'd never heard of it before. But I read the article and I thought, that looks kind of cool. And like the idiot that I am, and, and, and also I'm extremely optimistic and I think everything's going to work out great, I decided to do it instantly. So I'm in the middle of fall semester and I started filming videos that day to, uh, or, or shortly thereafter to, to flip my classes the very next semester. I, I wouldn't, most people who flip don't suggest doing that where you're filming the videos during the semester that you're flipping. Usually it's better to have them all made in advance, but I did that because I am a crazy person, but I, it ended up working out okay, and I got some very positive uh, responses from my students, actually, surprisingly, and not because of anything. I'm, I think they were really generous, but anyway, they, they said they liked it. So um, since that time, I've actually taught organic chemistry. So I teach the two-semester full-year organic chemistry course for sophomores. I flip-taught that twice, and I flipped my gen chemistry class. Um, I think I've got, I lose track of how many times I've, I've done a gen chem. I flipped Gen Chem, I think, one full time. And then the first time I tried to flip Gen Chem, I kind of ended up half flipping it. So, uh, so uh, this whole talk is, this original talk was just talking about my organic chemistry section. But I do both. So <clears throat> after the semester ended, I ended up posting all of my videos on YouTube. And the reason I did that is because I thought my students would be able to access them more easily. They're publicly available, everyone can get them, and of course it comes with the consequence of everyone on earth can access my videos. And those consequences have, thankfully, turned out to be very positive because I get lots of feedback not only from my students who watch the videos on YouTube, but from people all over planet earth who watch my videos and most of the feedback, in fact, I have a personal policy where I reply to every single comment that anyone posts on one of my videos. And if I do that every day, it just takes a couple minutes. But I do. Every single one I reply to. Uh, and thus far, I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments come in from all over the world. And I can only think of maybe two or three that have been negative. Usually, they fit into two categories. Ones that are highly oozingly positive, like, thank you for my videos. I've learned chemistry because of you. It's awesome. You're great. And, and others that are asking technical questions, like, can you please explain this or that? And, those, I don't consider either of those to be negative. I respond to those, and then I get a thank you, and it's great. I've, I've only had maybe two or three negative ones. One of them, oh, anyway, I won't tell you stories about that. But so far, I have 257 organic chemistry videos. I actually have 570 total videos now on my YouTube channel covering general chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, and all of the accompanying lab courses, as well as chemistry education and some other things, too. So, um, with all of that said, Flipping, here are some advantages that I've personally seen from my flipping uh, experience. So one of them is, generally speaking, when compared with traditional lecture format, I've actually done controlled comparisons where I've taught a class using traditional lecture style and then flipped the same class the next year and compared grades. Grades go up by an average about 5%. That's average. That's not every individual student, of course. I've also seen that total lecture time goes down by uh, 56 to 67%. 56 for OCHEM, 67 for GenCom. So I actually timed the total number of minutes that students spend listening to me lecture. When you put it into videos, it goes down by that much, which is huge <coughs> and surprising. Yes, go ahead, Tracy. Go up by 5%. Are you giving the exact same exam for yes. people from the traditional you know, lecture versus the uh, flipped environment? Yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, exact same. Does anyone have a guess as to why you think they go up? Because I haven't got a clue. <laughs> what do you think, Rich? Yeah, that's what I think too. And I think because they weren't doing the reading to begin with. 
Yes. B because in theory, content delivery can happen in a traditional lecture class too through the book, right? Mm -hmm. Students are a lot more apt to read a video or watch a video, read a video. <laughs> I'm reading this video. Uh, watching watch a video that's really consort uh, or concise and short than read a book for some reason. Yeah. So did you uh, when you're teaching traditionally, did you record your lectures? Um no. <sighs> For, no, I did not. No, sorry, I have to go back there in my brain. So that's sort of an intermediate step, right? If yeah. You record your lectures, then they can watch them after yeah. the fact, right, Rich? Yeah. And yeah, if you have somebody, if you did it in like a live class and did that, it, that's how they could do it. But even, even if it was separate, even if you had separate videos, they could still watch those repeatedly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I do that now. It's more modularized, right, when you do a flip. Because yeah. Because if you just record your whole lecture, you're on section 12.3 and 12.4, but in your Yes. Yeah, and so it's a very targeted. Plus, of course, in, in the traditional. Oh, yeah, sorry, I should point out that in the. Oh, hey, you're holding up your hand, Ryan. What's up? Sorry, I have to pop in being a video guy that does this. One it's of the a, things that I like to implement for a lot of people is actually. I work for media production, so we're part of the city. We help facilitate a lot of this stuff. You, you're, uh, you guys are the people who helped train me, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. You guys helped. Your predecessors helped train me on how to make videos. So thank you. Sorry, continue speaking. <laughs> So now instead of doing a 60 minute lecture, you've got <clears throat> this piece of lecture. Now you go down, read this article. Now go to this discussion board. Now go to here. So you chunk all these pieces of video that allow it to have a, a uh, resonate better with the students. And uh, I couldn't help but have to throw that in. Yes. <laughs> something that whenever they talk about video, no one ever really hits the fact that it's not a big video. No. It's a small video that you have in another ecosystem. I'm glad you said that, Ryan. Thank you. B because all of my videos on average are a, the max length that I do my videos now. W when I first started making videos, sometimes they would get up to 30 minutes in length. Now I make them 10 or less. So if I, make a, if I film myself and it's 30 minutes, that is at least three videos. So I break it apart. And on YouTube, one thing that's cool is you guys have probably watched YouTube videos where there's these little bubbles. I'll show you some pictures, some screen captures, where you click on them and it jumps to another video or jumps to something else or jumps to something product you can buy or something stupid. Um, so my videos, I've got links that appear that say click here to watch the next vid, click here to watch the previous one. And I'll have strategically throughout the videos, those little bubbles pop up that say to see how to do this kind of problem, click here. And sometimes they'll jump from one course to a completely different course. So kids are taking OCHEM or GenCHEM as a prereq, a bubble pop up that says to review Lewis structures from way back last year, click this bubble and it'll take them back to one of my Gen Chem videos if students have kind of forgotten that. So that's also kind of a cool, that cross-referencing linkage. What is your YouTube video? Oh yeah, I don't know the HTML, but you can type in Christiansen Chemistry. My, my name is really long. So if you go, yeah, so my last name, I don't know if you can see that from here. <laughs> but yeah, if you go to YouTube and you type in Christiansen Chemistry, you can find it. Um, anyway, you, and, and you, have got, you got your, your Mac open right there, so you can look it up right now if you want, Karen. So. Oh, fantastic. I'm like, where have you been for the last three years? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I was there. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, I've surveyed my students. I've seen that the vast majority prefer to strongly prefer traditional lecture scale when they do Likert, Likert questions, but usually not at first. So it's usually at first, like week four survey, they're kind of tentative about it, so I'll sit down. And, and then afterwards, they, they warm up to it. So students, of course, can rewatch my videos forever, even after the class is over. I can use my videos to train new students who work in my research lab, and I do that sometimes. So I'll, I'll have some safety videos and conceptual videos, because um, I don't have any grad students in my program where I'm at, at the Uni Uni out at the Uinta Basin campus. Sometimes I'll have an intern who's straight out of high school and has maybe taken one trimester or semester, something of a high school chemistry class, and suddenly they're going to be working in organic chemistry, which you usually don't take until your second year of college. And I need to train that kid really quick. So I will send him links in an email to a bunch of videos and I'll say, your assignment is to watch all these videos before you set foot in my lab. And it saves me time. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Um, and then the other thing is I, of course, take joy and satisfaction from knowing that people all over the world have benefited from my videos. So 
Um, and then I've gotten tons of consulting work as a result of my videos. I've got some stories about that that I will skip. So Bergman and Sams, these two folks, uh, Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams, they're um, <clears throat> high school chemistry teachers from Colorado. They've written a book called Flip Your Classroom. And in fact, Rich Etchberger, who's right there and also at my campus in his office, is about you know, a few doors down from mine. He's the one who told me about their book. And I read it and I loved it. Um, and it's also cool because it's about their chemistry teachers, so I you know, connect to them even more. But um, they're pioneers of flipping. And they've got, gosh, I keep dropping this microphone. Ryan, I suspect you probably don't want me to film the audio coming off of the floor. So I will wrap this around my neck and see if I can get it. Yeah, the, the cord, not around my neck. Is my, is my neck OK? You OK with that? <laughs> we'll see. If, anyway, so, so they've got this quote in their book that I thought was really cool. It says, quote, when we taught in the traditional manner, the students who tended to get most of our attention were the brightest and best. Uh, students who would raise their hands first and ask great questions. In the meantime, the rest of the students would passively listen to the conversation we had with the inquisitive students. But since our introduction of the flipped uh, model, our role has changed. We spend most of our class walking around helping the students who struggle the most. We think this may be the single most important reason students thrive in the flipped model. So here's the deal. You get all of lecture outside of class. You might ask, what in the world do we do in class? Here's what I do in class. I uh, have homework problems that would normally be homework, but they're in-class problems now, and they're sets. And I assign my students to work in groups. So they're in assigned groups. And I've, I've varied with that where I've had people not work in groups and people work in groups. And I've seen, I've had them be able to work in groups voluntarily versus me forcing them to work in groups. I personally have seen better results when I force them to work in groups that I assign. However, whenever I do that, and I put this on the syllabus, I, I tell them, if you discover that you just have really big issues with your group or with just working groups in general, just send me a pr private email and I will change things. And I try to do it in a way that doesn't make it obvious who, whose fault it is. Does that make sense? So if I have one of my distance sites and they're all working in groups and I suddenly change the group, I'm not going to say, you know, when there's five of them, I don't want to point out and make it obvious. Yeah, yeah, this one student said you guys all suck and that's the reason I, ch yeah, I don't, I don't like to do that. So, but here's the thing. What do we do in class? Well, in class, of course, students are working problem sets. And so what I do is I strategically offer just-in-time or JIT lectures. Have you guys heard of that, They're just-in-time lectures? Essentially, when you offer a quick lecture, just maybe five, six minutes just to answer a concept that they're struggling with right in the moment. It's called just-in-time lectures, also JIT lectures in the literature. So J-I-T-T. Um, or JIT, yeah, I guess it's J-I-T. How many T's? Like three or four T's. Anyway, the point is. I just answer the questions that they have in the moment. And I do that with my distance students as well. Uh, and so I started, of course, the first time that I flipped, and, and, and this, of course, provides us with much more in-class time to have more personalized interactions between me, my students, and between my students and each other, especially when they're working and doing peer-peer interactions in their groups. Whew, does that all make sense? Any questions or issues so far, Boyd? How do you deal with, so you're teaching from you at a base, and you have a, a question from Tuwilla. Yeah. And then how they're, they're writing this complicated <coughs> Yeah. Here's how I deal with that. So, I um, mean, I was actually going to get into that, too. So in, in uh, I, actually, Boyd, are you OK if I answer that later on? I, and I swear I will. So um, I was just going to mention that one of the, well, I'm going to skip this slide. I wanted to show you guys uh, what the, f I'll go back to stuff later if we have time. Oh, yeah, I wanted to show you guys uh, the IVC broadcast teaching, because about half of you guys said you have not broadcast taught before. And that's OK. You're still good people. I just want to show you guys what that's like. So USU has actually been delivering live multi-way uh, courses in dis from distance since at least as early as 1984. And I've got a reference on that. They used to do it. We talked to some of the more seasoned folks who did this. They used to have like conference phones. And they'd have students at distance sites and be teaching over the phone. It just be, sounds horrible. But anyway, um, we now have 32 satellite campuses across the state. And in 2015, 57% of all USU students actually were at distance campuses, not Logan. Just so you know. That was in 2015. 2015 numbers, I got the references on that. And courses are often delivered through inter, uh, sorry, interactive video conferencing or IVC. So we folks who do this, we often call it broadcast teaching or IVC teaching. So if you hear that, that's what that means. Mike, I learned an interesting specific yes, go ahead. Monday at the new higher conference. Uh-huh. I believe it. Yay! Yay for us. Aren't we awesome? <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, by the way. Um, so what IVC does is, of course, lets professors teach to multiple sites, including students in the room, 
all at the same time. And so what we see in the background, we got pictures of this, uh, is we see, so this is a picture of a professor, and these are actual USU pictures. So professor will stand in front of a bunch of students in the class. At the back of the room, there are screens. This is actually one of, uh, so there's a music professor here on campus named Mike Christiansen. Same name as mine, exact same spelling. We are not the same person. I don't teach guitar. Anyway, <laughs> I do, we do get each other's emails sometimes. It's funny. But at the back of Mike Christiansen and other Mike Christiansen's rooms, and th this is what bar broadcast looks like. You've got this big screen that has split screen where you see all of your students at all of your distant sites from all over the state split. Sometimes those screens are far away if you've got a big room and you can't, and, and they're tiny depending on how many sites you've got, so you can't see your students. And so that presents sort of a, a logistical challenge where it's difficult to get to know your students' names by their faces. So what I do is over the course of the semester, I memorize their voices, which sounds weird, but you can do it. Everyone has a unique voice and a unique face, and so you can memorize a voice. Although occasionally, occasionally, there are people who, are, who I call voice clones where their voices sound exactly the same. And I'll tell them that sometimes. I'll be like, you know, you two, you are voice clones, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of funny. And then, of course, what students at the distance site see, and this is not a true picture of this, what they see is they see a projected screen of their professor who's at the distance site. They have microphones on their desks, which they can turn on at any moment in time and ask a question in the middle of lecture. It prevents some, uh, uh, so, so this picture is not correct because the professor's in the room. So imagine professor aunt being on the screen, I guess. That's what they say, so. So that's kind of what, what um, this experience is like. But it, all, it allows students from all over the state uh, in, place, in communities where they're place bound because we have a lot of non-traditional older, older students, for example, who have jobs. They can't move up to Logan. But they now have the opportunity to take classes and oftentimes receive uh, full bachelor's degrees in different programs through this kind of education. Yes, Dwight. <laughs> Yeah. The whole yes, that's what I usually do. The then, then that particular site gets and then I can see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and the way I usually set it up is is that screen becomes big, but even still, for most for my classroom, there's still Lego people. They're still tiny. I can't I can't see their faces. Occasionally, I'll see. I have students that I've get, gotten to know very very well over an entire year of teaching them, but I'll tell them I'll be like straight up. I have no idea what you look like because you're so tiny on that screen. If I ran into you at the store, I would not say hi because I don't know who you are. <laughs> and I, I had some students humorously go up to the camera. You know, here's what I look like. You know, and it, was, it was kind of funny. Um, so this is kind of the situation. But, so you guys can imagine when you're flipping. Traditional classroom setting flipping is a lot easier because what happens is I'm in the room with the students. I can walk around and see what they're doing and an answer questions as they go. In this setting, I w wanted to be really brave slash idiotic and flip my classes and I've got all these students at the distance site. So it presents a couple of challenges. First, <clears throat> you can't leave the podium. Sometimes I do leave the podium to help students in the room, but I will tell my students at the distance sites, I'm walking away from the camera, I'm still in the room. If you have questions, chime in, grab your microphone, I'll come running back to the podium. I'm just in, you know, I've just left for a moment, but I'm in the room. Uh, but you can't leave for long periods of time. You can't wander around the room. I obviously can't wander around until we invent teleportation or something. I can't wander around the rooms where they are. And the other issue is when I have students who are all by themselves at a site. I can't assign them to do group work. Whenever I have that happen, <clears throat> I usually do one of two things. I either ask them, would you like to be in a group with students at other sites and come up with some way through Skype or magic or something of being able to be in a group? Or would you like to be a group of one? And I let them choose. And I've actually not had any problems with that. Yeah, I'll zoom past all my dumb slides here. Um, and here's why. I set up my schedule so that my students can get the problem sets done in class in the days that we have allotted. There's no way you won't get them done on time and get 100% on them as long as you come and do the work. And one of the reasons is because I let them uh, send me the problem set I give them feedback and send it back immediately with no point punishment. As many times as they want until the due, due date. I tell them due date is judgment day. If you hand the problem set after that, it's worth half. And you can. And I post the answer key the next morning. And so I'm getting, now I'm getting to your question. How do I communicate with students who are at distant sites? Because we're working on problems that are on a problem set that I've written, I have my computer sitting there at the terminal or at the podium. You, I, you have written these. these are not yes, I've written them. No. I've written them and they, I've posted them on Canvas. They download them as PDFs and print them and they come to 
class with them and they meet in their groups. And the videos deal, in some of the videos I, I answer some of the problems or problems that are like the problems or I introduce concepts on some of the problems I don't, so they have to do them in class. But what I do is I tell them, at, if you're distance site, if you're in the room, obviously you can take your problem set up to me and I can look at it right there in person. If you're a distance site, here, here's what you do. I've got my email open, my computer right there at the terminal. Our classes are taught at night about two hours and two and a half hours, twice, twice per week. Students will either give them to their facilitator at their site, and all the facilitators at all of our sites have access to a scanner, and they will run down the hall and scan them to me and email them to me right there, or I'll just tell them, take a picture with your iPhone and email it to me. And, and so I'll have a student on a screen, I'm watching them snap a picture, punch a couple buttons on their phone, it sends to me, I open it up right there, and right on my computer, I can write on my computer on their PDF document, this is wrong, you need to look at this more closely, this is great, you know, that kind of thing, and then I send it back to them immediately, all in real time. And, I, and I, like I said, I let them do back and forth and back and forth as much as they want until due date without any point punishment so that no one's scared of sending it in early incorrectly. So that's why I say it's very, very difficult for them not to get 100% of the problem sets as long as they come. Okay, you've got a question? Is yeah. separate homework sets that you do in class versus homework that they do at home? Or there, there is no, no. no. Home. There, the homework at home is you watch the videos. Okay. Yeah. So that's completely clear. Yep. Uh, I do have, so of course, my videos follow the, the textbook. So for students who hate videos and prefer reading, which is a small, small minority, but some people are like that, you can read the textbook and get the same info. Also, I have a list of suggested problems from the textbook that are the most important that they can do in addition. They aren't graded. I'll if they want, they can ask me how to do them in class, but they aren't graded. Does that make sense? So, so that's optional. Yes? How large are your classes? Uh, so for my Gen Chem, it depends on first semester, second semester. First semester is always more Gen Chem. It's between usually 20 to 40 students spread across, or 50, 20 to 50 spread, spread across all my sites. And uh, usually I have between three and seven total sites, including the face-to-face -face students. And then for my OCHEM, it's between seven and 25. And that's all I've got. So was, there was a question here. Did you have a question? Okay. Are you sure? Do you want to make one up right now? No, no? you're answering all of Oh, good for me. Okay, in the back. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think that is definitely a huge piece because we have all this time in class that's freed up where I don't have to deliver lecture. I only deliver specifically the answers to what they are concerned with. I, yeah. I if anyone's interested, there's a lot of um, applications that you can use to make the lectures that you put on YouTube more interactive, like Zaption and Ed Puzzle, where they'll click on things. Like you'll, you'll be talking during a lecture, and this is something that some people might have a hard time with, but they don't have to click on it if they don't want to. They can keep going. Yeah. Huh. What, what, was, what was that last one called? No. Ed, Ed the Puzzle? Oh, okay. I've never heard of either of those. So, I believe you, though. <laughs> huh. Yeah, yeah. That is really cool. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because I mentioned that I kind of do something that might be like that. So here's an actual screen capture of one of my lectures. My lectures are not all me and PowerPoints, but most of them are. And I have a bubble that appears, and if they click that bubble, it opens up this video where I solve a problem. So is that what Zaption and Ed, Ed Puzzle are kind of like? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, annotations. And I put them, and I put, when I, whenever I film a lecture, I write down as I'm editing it, I need to put an annotation here that will jump to this past video. And I have a file that has a description of every single video. It's like 500 pages long now that I've ever made. So if I'm like, I don't remember where that video was with the HTMLs, I'll just like go to that Word file and search for the term that I need to find and find it. And then I'll post that link so students can jump around. I've got lots of jumping around if they want to, but they're totally optional. Thank you for bringing that up, though. So very cool stuff.
One thing that, of course, you can do in videos that you can't do in class is you can blow stuff up. Uh, and, and I can do, so this is a video of me, uh, these are supposed to be, these, this is Play-Doh I stole from my kids, but I got film of me manipulating them and trying to explain how molecules function. And this is me throwing a bunch of sodium in a bucket. And I, I, these are on videos, not in real life. I mean, I filmed it in real life, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, so um, we've got like three minutes. Holy smoke, all this time went by. So, so with, with almost no time left, I'm really surprised it took, this has been fun. Anyway, so I wanted to tell you guys really, really quick what I've discovered uh, about flipping in distance. One of the challenges that will always exist when you do this IVC teaching is the perceived distance between you and the students at the distance sites especially. And we always struggle to try and come up with ways of bringing those students in and helping them feel like we actually know who they are, we care about them, even though they're not physically with us. <clears throat> One thing that flipping allows me to do, um, first of all, with my distance suits, I tell them, when you have a question, you don't raise your hand, you just grab the mi microphone and, even, and start talking, even if I'm in the middle of a sentence. I'm not offended. Because it has to be that way, because I can't see their hands usually, because the images are so tiny sometimes. And so that's sort of one of the dynamics they have to get used to. But beyond that, what I strive to do is in every single class period, I strive to have at least one positive interaction with every single student. And sometimes the positive interactions are hilarious, but I try to do it. And sometimes I don't have enough time to do it with every single student, but over the course of the semester, I do it with every single student. For ex and here's the way I do this. <clears throat> I've discovered from having done surveys, of anonymous surveys of my students, the way I used to teach is this. I used to um, memorize, of course, all my students' names in the whole classroom. And when I would lecture, I would start, I'd come to a point where I needed to ask a question, and I would point to a student by name and say, what do you think the answer to that is? And I would do that, and I would call on individual students to, ask, to answer questions. And the reason that I did that is because I thought I was bringing my students in and engaging them, keeping them with me. What I discovered from my survey data is they hated that because if they didn't know the answer, which sometimes happened when I asked them a tough chemistry question, they would feel embarrassed in front of their peers. But I, and so I, I struggle, how in the world can I still do that but not embarrass students? And here's what I've come up with. You can agree or disagree with it, I, however you want. I can't, I, flipping especially lends itself well to this because all of my content delivery is done, not in class. So I'm only answering the questions that they've got as they've got them and addressing, so I've got a lot more in class time for free stuff. So what I do is, as I'm answering a question or talking about a concept that maybe students, and I always do a, a quick recap of what they should have seen in the videos before coming to class. I give them quizzes at the beginning of each class on the videos to make sure they actually watch them. Um, but anyway, in class what I do is when I'm answering or talking about a concept, if I've got a question that I, that's a concept question about chemistry, I address it to groups, not individuals. So I'll say, I want... Brigham City, it's you guys' turn to answer this question. I'll give you as much time as you want, and whenever you guys, you guys can you know, convene with each other, collaborate, and then when you come up with an answer, have some spokesperson tell me the answer. So I pose concept questions to groups, but I still want to draw on individuals, let them know I know their name, I know who they are, I care about them. And the way I do that is I ask stupid questions to individuals. And when I say stupid questions, what I mean is questions like this. So I'll be in the middle of talking about a concept. For example, I'll talk about solubility of molecules. Solubility, there are certain molecules that are soluble in water, certain molecules that are not. In order to figure those out, we have to use this table. I'm going to go through this. I go through that, and then I finish, and then I'll stop and say, now on that note, there is a question that I need to know the answer to that is so important. The very fabric of the space-time continuum is, is, is hinging upon this. Lindsay and Moab, I'm going to ask you this question. The question is, what is your favorite kind of food? That has nothing to do with the topic, right? And she'll tell me the kind of favorite kind of food. It's like, I really like Captain Crunch. And I'll be like, excellent. And then I'll bring in Captain Crunch into the lecture somehow. What is so great about Captain Crunch? Well, compared to other cereals, it doesn't get soggy. Exactly. It's just like molecules. There are certain molecules that dissolve in water and certain that don't. Let's go back to the solubility table. I had a student, and I do that with every single student, every single class period. I'll ask some stupid off-the-wall question. Sometimes I'll ask them about where they're from, what are your hobbies, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I, don't, do, I don't ask really personal questions, you know, you know invasive questions. <laughs> but you know, just kind of stuff like that to make sure, and I get to know them over the course of the semester. And I can't do that in a traditional lecture setting. I can't. There's just not enough time. But I don't have like big, long, 40-minute discussions about their goals. It's just like something really quick. And I learned, for example, that one student, uh, uh, Lindsay, everyone's named Lindsay in my classes, apparently. But I had one student, Lindsay in Brigham City, who played basketball at Weber State. 
And she told me that. I said, so what kinds of things do you like? She's like, I really like basketball. I play at Weber State. That's cool. And then in my lecture, when I'd continued doing a JIT lecture, I would somehow try and incorporate basketball into it. And sometimes I would do it a totally stupid way, because basketball, I can't like molecules in basketball. You know, It was hard sometimes. But I tried to do it, and it, at least the students found it funny. And then I had another student who was a mechanic in the Army. And I'd ask him, OK, Anthony, <clears throat> I need you to tell me, don't reveal any government secrets or anything, but tell me what kind of fuels do you usually see inside of uh, the stuff you fix? And then I'll use, talk about thermodynamics. You see what I'm talking about? So this is where I, I try to have a positive interaction with every single student at every single site, but especially the distance sites, so that by the end of the semester, they feel like I know them and I've brought them in. And I, and I do. I know all their names. I sometimes know the names of their kids and the names of you know, where they work and what they want to be when they grow up and stuff like that. I've got tons of comments, but no time to share them. I actually was going through more of my, yeah, I'm all out of time anyway. But that's sort of the technique that I've, I've adapted for being able to flip and, and still engage those distant sites. And I think it's been highly successful based on the feedback that I've got, gotten that I don't have time to share with you. So, any questions you guys want to ask? There's no time. So, yes. Who are your favorite comedians? Because your different lecturers. Yes. And what you've done is incorporated Richard Lewis, Martin Short. Oh, yes. I'm glad you mentioned. Okay, okay, okay. okay let me tell you. I've got, I've got an answer. I've got an answer. So, some folks who know me know that I actually did amateur stand up in high school and in college, and I wanted to become a comedian. My favorite four comedians are Richard Lewis, Brian Regan. Uh, by far, um, Alan Havey, you might not know him. And these are comedians from when I was growing up. There are new comedians that have come out, like Jim Gaffigan and uh, Dimitri Martin that I really like. And then my fourth was Dennis Leary, actually, who actually was a comedian. He was. Yeah, he's not now, but he, his stuff was really Did funny. Did you do some things like Martin Short, too? Uh, I, I like Martin Short. When he was Ed Grimley. Yes, yes, I look like Ed Grimley. I just need a spike on my head, you know. Errol Flynn? We're going back to the 1920s? I called the character from the... Oh, 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 um, you're talking about uh, uh, Tangled. Uh, yeah, Tangled. The what, what's the guy? Yeah, my, my daughter tells me that I look like the guy. Flynn Rider, yes. I don't know if I actually look like him, but my daughter thinks I do. So, And I dressed up, up as him in Halloween. Okay, are there any other questions before I let you guys go? Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. My, my smolder is, yes, thank you, me. My smolder is embarrassing. It's, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I look like Blue Steel from, um, from Zoolander, you know, whenever I do the smolder. It's, it's, you know, so anyway, thank you guys. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. I have to actually leave the conference and go visit. I've got a meeting with my department head, so I won't see you the rest of the day. But thank you guys for coming and seeing me and listening to my talk. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to look me up. It'll increase my head count. Thank you. <laughs>